Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti. Saluto anche il pubblico che ci segue in diretta. Good evening to you. Welcome, welcome also to those who are following us online. Veniamo al tema della serata, siamo tanti, il tema è interessante. I would like to remind them that we are in the main lecture hall of the Turin Polytechnic and let us talk about this evening. The topic is very interesting and so I'm expecting a very dense evening. We're talking about the uh, uh, real or universe and the virtual universe, that is to say how we study the world and how what we look at is not really a real universe. Uh, what we see it does not correspond to an objective reality, presuming that there is such a thing, but this would be yet another topic, uh, because in any case what we see depends uh, on our point of view, but it's also mediated to a degree by our brain. On the other hand, uh, there is um, a part of the world which uh, we cannot see because it's uh, beyond our visual ability. And to see this, uh, we resort to tools and instruments uh, that make it visible. And this, uh, to a degree, is a real universe that becomes a virtual one. I would like to stop here, and I would like uh, to introduce the people who will be talking about this topic. Uh, and I will start with Piero Bianucci, who's uh, sitting on my right, that I imagine you know. Piero Bianucci is a scientific journalist, uh, oh, founder and director for editor-in-chief for, for 25 years of uh, Tutto Scienze. He's also a writer, and I'll, uh, he has written various um, books to popularize, and I would like science, and I would like uh, to talk about the, the last two, or the latest two, I should say, To See and to Look by Utet. It's the latest, but it's 2015. It's about time uh, to write another, and the previous one, which is a sentimental story uh, of astronomy by Longanesi. Uh, he also has a planet of 4,821, which is between Mars and Jupiter. But as you all know, he became even more famous in last November when he became the co-conducer of Giovedi Scienza. That is to say, that's a joke. Uh, But I had to say that uh, Piero Biannuccio is uh, one of the people who established, who founded these uh, conferences uh, that I am now honored uh, to present, uh, although possibly I'm not worthy of it. But this evening he's not here as in, he's a guest. Uh, on my left, uh, we have uh, Professor Attilio Ferrari, whom I'm sure you're all acquainted with. Attilio Ferrari is an astrophysicist. Uh, He has been studying galaxies. He works uh, in Italy, but also on an international level, Princeton, MIT in Boston, the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And in 2012, he was um, awarded the Rossi Prize for a discovery. Will you be talking about that later? Maybe, yes. And um, in the Crab Nebula, and he will be talking about uh, the virtual universe and what we need to see them. And then, at my far right, Marco Brusa, who, yes, I forgot to say that Attilio Ferrari is also president of the Turin Planetarium, which, uh, as you know, is not in Turin, but in Piro Torinese, which is very close. And Marco Brusa is uh, one of those uh, uh, who works at the planetarium and gets his hands dirty. And he uh, actually runs it and builds uh, performances, because they are performances in the dome uh, where we have the projections. The planetarium is also a museum of astronomy. And Marco Brusa is one of the people who physically runs it. Uh, because he guides uh, the public uh, uh, through the various installations, making everything more interesting than what it is already. And this is as far as our speakers are concerned. While at our far left, we have uh, the two gong players. Um, please switch the mic on. 
and please introduce yourselves and try the gong. Sono Luca Caci, studente del liceo scientifico presso My name is Luca Caci. I study in the Mazzarello High School. Sono in classe di Luca, eh, studiamo liceo Mazzarello. My name is Maria Clara Girani and I am in the same class and Bene, smetto di parlare, ma non prima di aver parlato. Right, I'm going to stop speaking, but not before giving the floor to Piero Bianucci. Buonasera. Buonasera a tutti. Io parto da un oggetto che ci è familiare. Good evening to you all. I would like to start with an object that we know, and uh, this is an ancient uh, clock. This is the, an enormous uh, clock, so to speak. Uh, this is a million and millions of kilometers. The sun, the sun, and the earth rotating on its own axis, uh, all this turns into a little shadow, which tells us what time it is. Uh, that time at there, in that place, uh, while it's the only one which will give us the time there, it's the real time, while all the other clocks uh, have a conventional one. If you move by a few meters, it'll be different. Their big advantage is that they don't have to be fine-tuned or regulated because it's the Earth itself that does it. But if you want to know the, about the very accurate uh, uh, clocks uh, uh, that are now being manufactured and produced uh, on the, the newsletter review, uh, which will be coming out on March the 5th, that there will, is an article where a group uh, of uh, the Alabama University announces uh, that they have uh, uh, created an atomic clock uh, that has an accuracy of uh, 2.5 by 10 to minus 6, uh, which means uh, that it is 10 times more accurate than the most accurate ones we have so far. So next week it should be published. Um, this also means uh, that a clock uh, like that, which, uh, if it is stable, which is not certain, uh, from the beginning of the universe uh, to Big ba Big Bang to the present, could make a maximum of a mistake of uh, one tenth of a second, which is very good. But it is not as accurate uh, as uh, this clock because this is the time in that place. So now, optimists here will be seeing dawn. Pessimists might see a sunset, but neither of you will actually be seeing it because the sun is below the horizon. It might seem impossible or crazy, but it's actually like that. It's due to refraction. Light in moving from the vacuum or the void of the space between the Earth and the Sun is deviated. This doesn't happen if you look at a star which is at the zenith, that is to say, right above your head. Otherwise, objects are not where they seem to be. One is to do with refraction. Refraction is very important. In fact, uh, close to the horizon at 2 degrees, it's 18, which is about half uh, the apparent diameter of the moon. But uh, at the horizon, it's more than 35. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the diameter of the moon is about 30 to 31. But uh, you will be still seeing it at, at dusk and dawn, already seeing it or still seeing it. Um, this is only one of the factors. There's also another thing is uh, that uh, eight minutes and 20 seconds uh, go by for the light to arrive from the sun. The light had to travel to see us, and because refraction has shifted where we see it. Uh, so the universe we see is not real, but uh, it's a universe uh, that we can recreate uh, uh, with, uh, uh, thanks to the Homo sapiens brain. Then there are some. Uh, uh, ideas very commonly accepted that bother me. The supermoon is a journalist uh, ad invention, and as a journalist, I despise this. In fact, uh, one moon could be a bit bigger than another or brighter than another. Um, um, every now and again, the moon is closer to the Earth. Uh, 
sometimes 356,000 kilometers, uh, but it can also reach uh, 406,000 kilometers. So there's quite a, a big difference, 50,000 kilometers. So when it's closer, it looks a bit bigger, about one twelfth of the apparent diameter. Very difficult to judge, uh, I'm sure that you're here, there are some people who are really enjoyed because I can see that there's someone here with uh, uh, three journals, one is Sky and Telescope World, so they must be following us. So, so this variation cannot be easily estimated. We can estimate it, uh, but uh, the untrained eye wouldn't see it. Another reason why a moon can look very big is not that it's bigger, but the fact that there is an optical illusion. And that is an adjustment that our brain does with images that send to the occipital area. In fact, we look at the world that we are with the part of the brain that's behind us, and sometimes this might generate a confusion, a degree of confusion at least. It's the so-called Ponzo illusion. Ponzo was a, is a psychologist, an Italian psychologist, Mario Ponzo, who studied this phenomenon. Uh, here you can see it's reproduced, but this is uh, clearer. In this case, um, the two yellow, uh, this is not certainly a Rome station, but this uh, railway, and you can see that the two yellow ones, the two yellow lines are exactly the same length, uh, but they don't look it. Uh, and the same can be said for the cylinders. That is to say that our brain reinterprets uh, things. Uh, there's no uh, super moon, and there's a moon on the horizon, which apparently becomes bigger or looks bigger. This only happens if there is a full moon with a perigeum, that is to say, the moon really being close to the Earth. Uh, I don't think that that's very frequent, uh, or it isn't. Uh, but it's relatively frequent, that is to say, once every two years it happens. Uh, and uh, there is, um, Americans have a saying, which is a blue moon. The farmers used to call a blue moon um, the second full moon of a month. This may happen because there are 29 days, 29 days and a half, and in a month there are 30, 31 days, except for February that has 28, except for leap years when they had 29. So there can be two full moons, but it's not very frequent because usually it's out of phase between the months and the moon. Although our farmers uh, uh, are convinced that, that there is a relationship between the, the lunar phases and uh, their crops, and this is not true. Uh, the, and this is also true. The Farmers Union also believes uh, that uh, GMOs are not good for you. But this is also not true. Well, if there is a second moon, the Americans say in called, call it a blue moon, a rare one. We would say every time a bishop dies, which is a rare event, uh, while blue moon in Italy was interpreted as a blue moon. I heard the news saying the other day a, that there would be a super moon and that it would have been blue because it was a blue moon. And it would also have been uh, red because there was an eclipse. So in theory, you wouldn't have seen the moon because it would have been eclipsed. Uh, but this is type of the information we have to deal with. So beware, it lo you have to look at the universe uh, uh, with, uh, this is with a bit of uh, common sense. Uh, this is uh, the reddish one, partly eclipsed, but there's another common saying which I'd like to get rid of. I'm just an astrophile, but not a real expert. Uh, but this is what you do. You know, in the real good rock uh, conference, yes, you have the starlets, and then you have the big stars. Now, in any case, uh, that stars are intangible, something very remote. Uh, no, stars touch us. Uh, they touch us uh, with uh, this rays of light. Uh, this is a line of photons. Uh, it's uh, like a ring of pearls, and each pearl is a series of photons that reach our retina and our brain. So they touch us physically with their light. The problem is that stars are not where they seem to be. The stars, uh, the sun is never what it, it looks like. Uh, they're at different uh, distances. Uh, here I have used the Orion. Uh, here you see Orion. Uh, we see is the light uh, that started, uh, for example, in uh, 
1376, the one that comes from Belterjus, uh, which is roughly when we had Boccaccio here, while Rigel is a little bit further away. It's 1154. This is when St. Francis was going around, while Saif is at 1298, the M42 Nebula, which you can... Uh, one of the very few you can see, but not in our polluted sky, but as from uh, February the 1st, we have uh, a law that uh, limits uh, uh, the light pollution because we started uh, fighting for it in 2000 and then 2008, and we've now implemented it in 2018, and this brings us uh, to 674, roughly when Islam began, and so on and so forth. Uh, Syria is only 2000, Sirius is only 2009. That is to say, when we talked about uh, when we would start uh, to uh, reform the Light Pollution Act. Stars are not there. They're not, not only because uh, they show us a sky uh, which uh, comes from different times. So all the things that we see and that look contemporary, but the stars continue to move. So every star has uh, started to move. This is the famous uh, Dipper the bigger one, 100,000 years ago, today, and uh, what it looks like. Now, we're used to seeing it as it is today. Stars uh, are not where they are. We are not seeing the sky as it is. Uh, if uh, we go back uh, to see special relativity, they live in a different era. They move, they move uh, at uh, thousands of kilometers a second, so an accurate uh, clock like the Alabama University one would realize immediately that it have to change the rith its rhythm if compared with another one. This is uh, the relativity of um, uh, 1905, Einstein, but there's the other one, which is the 1916 one, the general relativity. Also, gravity will influence uh, the rhythm of the clock, and this uh, is particularly important so much so that if you have a very big object, it will clearly slow down or slow down this clock. Imagine that you have a clock on a star of neutrons, a neutron star, and you see the time works in a very different um, uh, way. And if you're in a black hole, time stops, um, and uh, the light uh, does not necessarily travel in a straight line. This is what we're taught at school. It's true, but but in the cosmic space, uh, there are masses uh, that are distributed in a different way. If, these, uh, li if the light uh, uh, goes close to it, it's deviated because they follow the curvature, uh, the space-time tape, these are gravitational lens, uh, the tools that astronomers, and I have one to my left and one to my right, uh, are instruments that very often use these gravitational lens. That is to say, there's a big telescope uh, to start with. For example, the ESO one in the Europe in Chile, but uh, the telescope looks at objects uh, which have uh, a an visibility that is improved by the fact that their light was concentrated, uh, and this concentrated uh, uh, the light of objects that are further away. So basically, now there are telescopes. Uh, uh, that have cosmic uh, uh, orders of magnitude, especially if we're looking at objects that are very far away. Here there is a gravitational uh, wave, uh, which uh, is uh, a gravitational lens in Abel 2218. Uh, here the, def the d deformation is very clear because uh, the lenses are not exactly uh, like uh, the ancient ones we had for Galileo, for example. They're very proximate. So this is a bit as if you were looking at the bottom of a uh, glass. The space is strongly deformed by this mass, but this mass is not perfectly aligned between the object that is behind it and we that are looking, for it, looking at it, and the mass is not exactly symmetrical. So the result is uh, that the light is deviated, but not in a perfect way, but it is enough uh, to to concentrate the light of the objects uh, that are further away as opposed to the lens itself. And this is a very big advantage in a big case uh, 
because uh, it uh, enhances our telescopes, but we don't really see the real universe, we, but it's mediated uh, by objects that are in between. I'm about to conclude, and I would like to come back to Earth uh, and uh, introduce uh, this globe. Now, you know, there is an international movement uh, for, to free uh, them uh, from their rigid support. It's a very important international movement, uh, and you'll realize soon why, and, uh, because that it's true. It's important because it's international, that's the first thing, but also it has uh, some very important uh, teaching aims. Why? What is they free the globes uh, from? They detach them from their supports that keeps them inclined by 23 degrees and a half uh, that our axis uh, has uh, um, in relation to the Earth orbit. Now, we can put it uh, as we imagine things to be. None of us, uh, dwellers of the Turin, None of us uh, living in Turin, which is the geometrical city par excellence, we don't think that we're s bending over 45 degrees. We get the feeling that we're standing up straight. But if you think of it and you start to take a globe, you free it uh, and you rest it on an object uh, such as the one you see here, and you put uh, Turin instead of the North uh, Pole, the one point uh, towards the zenith, uh, and you imagine that you're there, put a little pin there, and then look at the shadow and of the pin and our shadow then. You will see that you will at long last realize of your what your impression, not what actually happens, that all the planet is below. Because when we stand up like this, uh, we get the feeling that we have all the Earth beneath us. Uh, so seven and a half billion people beneath our feet. Some think uh, that it's really like that. It's not like that. It's not like that. We are all equal. And I will stop here because we've got elections in a few days. Well, I would like to still add what you're about to listen, that is to say that all I've shown you so far is a virtual universe in the sense uh, that you can find reality, but you have to dig a long way. But we are looking at it uh, from a very small point of view, which is visible light. There are very many lights, uh, and as I said, universe touches us uh, with the light rays uh, that are light of photons uh, emitted by the various stars, but sometimes uh, also with cosmic particles. Uh, and this is another way in which we can get to know the virtual universe in the sense that we have to recreate the image. This is a very high energy neutrino detector where the detector is uh, the mass of the Antarctic ice. These are some very high energy neutrinos that were observed. And then uh, this is another way of touching us uh, is when the universe um, uh, sends out gravitational waves. Uh, the light um, um, will tickle our retina, but the gravitational waves are a bit like noises and they will affect our ears. Thank you very much. Grazie Piero Bianucci, la parola Thank adesso ad Attilio Ferrari. And now the floor to Attilio Ferrari, who will be opening other windows onto the universe. Piero ha già raccontato tutto sulle Piero stelle. Piero has already e said quindi, everything uh, about stars. At least he, he has uh, given us uh, the poetic uh, description of stars and planets uh, 
I'm the ones in which we see this guy. I will take a slightly different attitude, that is to say, an attitude linked to the actual use of images, uh, uh, which we all do, but which, in particular, astronomers do, other and beyond what we see with our eyes. So this is the first point. I would, Piero has already said, I would like to say that the images that we refer are virtual representations uh, that have been processed by our eyes and our brain, and uh, they are virtual representations of the real world. Um, now, we should also consider that all our lives are based on images. In fact, we are not made to see numbers, to see equations, to see graphs. In fact, uh, Uh, we see images uh, and we play around with them in the sense uh, that we remember uh, throughout our lives uh, and uh, throughout our position in the universe uh, or in the world through these images. Uh, this folly that we all have of going around with uh, a smartphone and taking hundreds of photos uh, wherever we are, which we will never probably look at again, but sometimes we say, Let us uh, go and find it, because what was I doing on that day, uh, that day, the day when, uh, for example, uh, they uh, landed on the moon, or what was the image, or so on and so forth. Uh, um, so for, say, when people landed on the moon, uh, you can have an image. Uh, the images are our point of reference, and these uh, images are the ones which Piero was talking about, uh, and which help us look beyond our planet, look and uh, start the sun, the moon, and I've also put uh, uh, an image of uh, what uh, the astronauts uh, could see, that is to say the image that human beings uh, took of the world um, um, seen from the moon. I like to refer to these images because these images, through our memory or through what it represents, inspire us. Here you can see the pale blue dot as it was seen by a voyager, voyagers one at the distance of four billion miles, that is to say six billion ca uh, kilometers roughly. It's a blue dot, a pale blue dot, but in spite of everything, it's uh, quite uh, different. Uh, first of all, it's blue, which is different from the others. If you go and look all the other planets, there's a red, a yellow one, a green one, and so on. But uh, they're mostly gray, not very interesting. Or Jupiter, for example, has a number of stripes. But in particular, this blue dot is the one which Carl Sagan had, remember, and he says that from this point, The Earth might not seem particularly interesting, but for us it's different because it's the only world we know. And as far as we know, it's the only one that has life on it. In a certain sense, this image inspires us. Carl Segal goes on with his presentation and also says uh, uh, what Dante was saying, the Earth uh, uh, we are lo that we are lost in seen from afar. Now, this image um, in itself uh, inspires many of our thoughts. However, we don't only use uh, images uh, from photos. We also use them uh, to educate ourselves, to learn. Uh, we don't see the movement of uh, the planets around the sun, but we can represent it. And thanks to this image, we're able to understand how they move. The inner ones uh, are faster, uh, have a faster rotation, and the outer ones are slower. And And they uh, correspond to Kepler's law, while on the right you can see is a small asteroid uh, that rotates with us around the sun. Or alternatively, we can represent things uh, that are necessary to learn. For example, Bohr's atom. It's absolutely not like this. Uh, we know that there's no electron uh, that rotates like this. It's a little bit more complicated, more refined. 
funzioni donna che rappresentano gli oggetti. There are functions and so on. Però serve a farci vedere But cose, alcune come le gambe di droga. useful or the hydrogen bonds in water explain why water behaves in a certain way. Water is very important to us and this is something we will have to talk about another moment or how sodium and chloride quali sono quali Secondo lei, professore, perché dal momento... Professor, in your opinion, since uh, that images are important for us, in fact, human beings have always tried to find mathematical modeling to explain things. Uh, this, well, for example, quantum mechanics or two. I don't really think so. If we will get there subsequently, I will show you that, in fact, even to this day and age, we study through numbers, graphs, and equations, but in the end, we have to see things. We have to represent them to this day when I want to understand how a galaxy operates or what are the distribution of the different galaxies are, I must have an image. It's very important to have an image in spite of the fact that that result might be the result of equations or numbers, as I was saying before. But we'll get there. We'll get there in a moment. Others, for instance, uh, you can explain. I'm not showing anything fundamental. What I would like to draw your attention to is that very often, thanks to an image like this, uh, we can show, we can help people understand concepts and notions which might be um, slightly more complex. Uh, so when you have a book uh, and you take it, uh, you can find all the equations as uh, the gong player was suggesting, this was uh, much harder to understand. We can see the waves, uh, this drop uh, that falls on water, and we will understand what an interference wave are, that there are areas uh, that are light and darker when two signals, uh, two different types of drops fall. Or I can have, uh, and this is, I can virtually see, photograph it. Uh, uh, that is to say, the blast of a supersonic just uh, I can do that in a lab it's easier uh, than uh, close to a, a plane but I can also see uh, the turbulence uh, that you have in the wake of a supersonic jet you can see it normally when you when a plane goes by now there's a very important content um, in studying uh, that because it refers uh, to the turbulence uh, and the hydrodynamics uh, of the flow it also helps us uh, to understand maths so I let them you go on like this uh, you know that the early mr. Pythagoras so when he represented in this and tried to prove his theorem, uh, played on this, so you with the air images like this, uh, cutting out uh, uh, what was uh, the uh, square, attaching them together, and uh, giving rise uh, to uh, the uh, type of square that you have uh, on the hypotenuse of a triangle. This was just to say that we use, we have the habit uh, to see and to discuss uh, by images, through images. Uh, hardly ever do we discuss numbers. Uh, but let us see now what science uh, does with these images. Why do we use images? Uh, just as uh, our young friend was asking, how they manage uh, to translate numbers into data. For example, we use it uh, to represent diagrams. Uh, here, if you look at it, if you go to the weather center, you have all these uh, figures, but in fact, uh, Donald Duck uh, tries to represent it with numbers and uh, and then puts it all in a computer, and if it is accurately prepared, what do they get? The weather forecast. The shift, the image that you see on the right is what you find every day, but it starts with numbers that you have processed and you try to understand. But if you gave you, if they gave you just your numbers, uh, maybe the weatherman or weatherwoman uh, would possibly understand them, but you wouldn't, uh, nor would.
or die. Another example is this, uh, that is to say, thanks to this graph, you see, as with uh, as time goes by, you can see how the average temperatures changed. When we talk about climate, uh, usually there are people say it's warmer, it's not as warm, and since uh, it's very cold, may people say, well, global warming isn't working. Well, you see that as time goes by, in fact, everything is becoming redder and yellower, which means that there is a higher average uh, uh, temperature level as compared uh, Uh, to another period. Now, that image immediately conveys the idea, maybe, if uh, even Trump would understand it if he had time to look at it, and maybe he would agree that global warming is a problem. So, images are good, but uh, let us move on to astronomy. As... Uh, Piero Bianucci was saying, what we see, what we receive are photons, that is to say electromagnetic waves. So these are the ones that put her in touch, that is to say, with cosmic events. They send us energy and we transform it to see, into images. We can produce very beautiful images. And lately we've also managed, using electromagnetic waves, we've managed to Uh, to reach the close to the beginning of time, that background uh, radiation that tells us um, how the universe was or what it was like uh, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. They take us back in time. That image, the one you can see, was the result of uh, a series of photons that were captured. Photons were captured and then processed. Uh, cleaned up uh, and bear in mind that if you take a photo, all you're doing to reach uh, the bottom of the universe, uh, you have a long road in the middle, stars, galaxies, and so on. You have to erase all that information uh, to reach uh, the background. That image, uh, which is the one that helps us understand how, what the beginning of the universe was like and what the Big Bang was like, in fact, is the result of a major processing but we understand it thanks to the fact that we can see that image once again. If uh, we were given the raw data, we wouldn't really uh, understand it. So the work that we've been uh, doing to carry out uh, our studies on the beginning of the university is to work on images. Um, we capture photons. Uh, if we want to look away, um, distant in the universe, uh, we use uh, large mirrors. Uh, if we're talking about optical telescopes or infrared, uh, we use uh, the CCD ones, uh, which you have in slightly more refined, uh, but the ones that the astronomers are more refined, but it's the one you have on your smartphone. So those are the same tools uh, that don't immediately give us an image, but point by point uh, tell us about the photons there are, where they hit, and if you know where you are pointing, uh, Clearly, even if you oscillate, uh, you can reconstruct an image. Uh, bear in mind uh, that uh, to take uh, the images uh, from the space telescopes, uh, you have to reconstruct an image. Um, in fact, uh, the space telescope doesn't take photos uh, because they would all be Uh, blurred because of movement, uh, because there's a certain type of oscillation. But you do in Well, in your facility, what you do is you record the photo and you know which the direction is because you have optical sensors that tells you what the telescope is seeing. So even if it's uh, slightly blurred because of movement, you can clean up the image so that it doesn't look blurred. Now we manage to work with high energy photons, x-rays, gamma rays. I was just to have fun a second, I would like to show you the gamma ray sky map, which is one of the 
outer bands of the electromagnetic waves are that to have been observed. This, as you can see here, is basically the gamma rays that are partly widespread in the galaxy. This is the plane of the galaxy. This is what you would see in the optical one. And then here you have some regions that are especially interesting. One of them is in this object, which is called the Crab Nebulosa, um, the, or Nebula, sorry. Um, this is a small star here, which is a pulsing star, which is a star um, on itself. It's a pulsar. It rotates, um, and it uh, concentrates um, uh, its emission. It rotates on itself 30 kilometers, uh, and it rotates at 33 milliseconds in particular. It rotates every 33 milliseconds, so blah, very quickly. If um, you see here also that it emits uh, in that image, uh, this it um, tells you what uh, the uh, intensity is. Um, there are several of these objects, and in particular, one in the gamma ray band, as well as uh, in the radio one. But now, let us see another type of object, uh, which is also reconstructed in the same way. This is an outer galaxy. It's an active galaxy. If you go inside, this is the optical image. Sappiamo quello che c'è, questa è un'immagine inventata in un certo senso, ma sulla base di risultati eh, che si ottengono, ed è un oggetto estremamente variabile. È un buco nero dentro il quale sta cadendo del materiale e al, a seconda di come sta cadendo il materiale può avere delle grosse variazioni no, che, eh, che lo caratterizzano. Eh, that you have and that roughly corresponds to it. It's uh, comparable, and we know what there is. This is an image that has been invented in a certain sense uh, on the basis uh, of the results that were obtained, and it is extremely variable. It's a black hole, material is falling inside it, and according to how the material is falling, it may have major variations uh, that are its hallmark. Let us go beyond. The Crab Nebula, as I was mentioning before, is that small, has that small pulsar, and it's that dot that changes in intensity. Now you can't see it, then suddenly it becomes red, and then it becomes white. This was an object of the Crab Nebula that appeared to be constant, while recently we've seen that it changes every now and again. Suddenly there are Every now and again, there are sudden explosions. So here, there's another aspect, not only the image. We usually see static images. But at this point, we're not only seeing static images. We're seeing images that are ever-changing. Then there is another use that can be made of these images. There are objects that we can't see. We have all the signals from them. And uh, through computers, we have to do what our eye does uh, when it uh, sees, uh, for example, electromagnetic waves, it processes it, and then uh, we process it in our brain. For example, there are objects uh, some, such as gravitational waves uh, that uh, Piero Bianucci was mentioning earlier on, where we don't have uh, one way of seeing gravitational waves, but by analyzing them, and in particular by analyzing other signals uh, in the electromagnetic band, uh, we can see a signal and interpret it. Um, a signal uh, that, for example, was obtained August uh, last year. The image uh, that you can see below is the signal of uh, the gravitational waves as picked up by LIGO, and the one above is the electromagnetic band, and in particular, gamma raise the combination of these two signals, uh, not only of the signals, but the, anal uh, the an analyzing of all these uh, 
This information enabled us so to produce these images. This is a, an image that we created, but if we were able to put gravitational waves uh, together with the other information, this is what we would probably see, and if we were able to see that far. With this, basically, you can understand what happened there at that particular moment. Then, sure, you've also, and I'm certainly not going to be talking about this in detail, but you've heard a lot mentioned about dark matter. The fact that it is dark means that we can't represent it, that we can't see it directly. However, we can see the impact or the effects, uh, gravitational effects, uh, that are generated by it. And for instance, uh, in the blue graph that you can see on your left, uh, you can observe uh, the observations or the results that you have uh, from uh, the telescope uh, looking into the space um, and studied, analyzed uh, where this dark matter should be to e explain all the, those phenomena, such as gravitational lenses that Piero was mentioning earlier on. Thanks to those studies, I can then understand what they're made of. And through that, for example, you can you explain the development of the universe, which is not only dominated by normal matter, but also by dark matter. And there's also dark energy, which I don't know how to represent. We, we still don't know how to represent it. We know that this exists. This energy is uh, ex leading the universe to expand. This is a graph to give you an idea. This is not an image. It's just a graph to represent it. Uh, you should represent it in three dimensions and throw on. I would like to add one last point uh, as far as uh, the scientific use is concerned. So far, we've only mentioned the representation of, uh, or how we represent, how we translate the photons that come from the whole universe and that we translate as images to understand what is happening. But lately, we have also been using images the other way around. Thanks to the fact that uh, all this work uh, that we have spoken so far developed uh, since we've had very strong, powerful computers able to process our data very quickly so as to give us results. Well, the same calculators, the same computers, I should say, uh, we help us to start from the equations, starting from the physics uh, written into the equation, and we do what we call simulations, numerical simulations. They're not simulations uh, that we pretend that, uh, but they're simulation in that they're the processing of that equation to show what the impact is or the effect that they have on certain physical phenomena. First, we calculate all the results of these equations, and then we represent them as images to try and understand what is happening, and in particular, to compare them to the uh, actual data. Now, very quickly, uh, with this, uh, we have tried to represent, we have lots of images here of the active galactic nuclei uh, that are based on this. Here you can see there are cores. Uh, the cores uh, uh, of matter that is falling in to a black hole, but at the same time uh, there is matter that is expelled and that is perpendicular to the plane. If you put here someone who can work on the computer, the people, usually they're rather strange people. There was one I used to know, there he is, uh, that he worked a lot on these things. Uh, and. Uh, we put it all in the computer, and then we try to simulate in the good sense of the world and not with a, any bad ideas at the back of our mind, but to represent what we can see so that we can compare uh, theory with experiments. If it works, what does it mean? It means that the physics that you have used is reasonably correct. Uh, it'll never be comprehensive because the universe is much more complex and comprehensive than what you can put. But it means that at least it contains uh, most of the effects that are required for things to work. 
Now a few equations, uh, for example, here you can see these uh, are, this is on the bottom left is a magnetic field, the magnetic fields uh, that are distorted by the matter that is, uh, uh, um, that is undergoing accretion. Here you can see the black hole is written it's represented as white, but in fact it's black. Uh, here you can see there are supersonic jets, and you can see through the accretion area, or the accretion disk, which is the orange area, you can see how the supersonic jets uh, develop. So, not only this, this is a jet that is represented in a more accurate manner. You can study the hydrodynamics and the magnetics of the system. And amongst other things, uh, you will be representing phenomena, which I was, I was mentioning earlier on, that if compared with reality, gives us, give us ideas uh, and confirm or disconfirm whether we're using equation, the right equations. Uh, we are pushing uh, the equations that we used uh, uh, to limits that cannot uh, yet be checked or reproduced in a lab but you can then take them back to the lab and see what is happening in astrophysics. Astrophysics exists to push things to the limit, to the extreme limit, um, any physical phenomenon. So by learning astrophysics, I can repeat in a lab what we're trying to do, for example, with a nuclear fusion, and we know that is what is happening in the sun, all the modeling, but if we manage to have a gravitational field like the one of the sun, it would be all done. But since we have failed to do so for the time being, these are other images, a solar wind, star winds, stellar winds, in fact. I will not be showing you the image, but let us not forget. I would like to mention the fact that one of the fields Numerical simulations uh, are used because uh, they are the only way in which we can manage a large number of objects to represent our universe. All these simulations uh, are then carried out through cosmological fields. Let me see if it's that. Here you can see it. I would like to accelerate it, but I don't know how to. These are images that help us represent the universe as we see it, as we should see it, as we would see it if we were outside it. It's the universe as God himself would have seen it on the basis of it. So these are not Hollywood movies. We start from observation, the photons. I'm not going to go on. I will stop here, but I would like to say that those images is something that if you have a smartphone, a reasonable smartphone, with a few, with a good memory or storage, you can download them from scientific uh, sites, and all this is the result of the ability to visualize things. And they started from the scientific need to process large numbers of data and numbers and then have a representation. If you come to our planetarium, and Marco will be talking about it, uh, basically, thanks to this visualization, you can represent... Quali sono le immagini che lei spera di vedere nel futuro con sicurezza? What are the images which you hope to see in the future? Il futuro, beh, forse... Future, well, maybe it would be beautiful. Well, today I read an article. We look for images. For instance, uh, we, in the radium low-frequency band, they've seen 
tista about one million years from the Big Bang. They're not stars, in fact, they're the beginning of uh, the stars. It's uh, the 21 radium uh, band, which is transferred into the band because of the cosmological shift. Uh, so I imagine that sooner or later, we will have a lot of information closer and closer to the Big Bang. We will not only have the idea of the background uh, radiation, and probably, thanks to gravitational waves, uh, we will, in fact, be able to enter the Big Bang. I don't know how they'll do it. There are a series of problems for that, but I think that thanks uh, through also polarization that leaves signals and so on. So we will manage to look into it. I don't know whether we'll see, we'll see the other side through the whole of the Big Bang, but maybe we'll imagine it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Attilio Ferrari. And now the floor to Marco Brusa, who will show us how images can be used not only to produce science, but also to tell it. Good evening to you all. Welcome also on my behalf. My task is that of concluding uh, this round, giving you a few examples of visualization of the sky. We've spoken about virtual images, but how can you virtualize uh, all the data that we have? Before beginning, I would like uh, to tell you uh, that you can see a rather sad image there. That's my presentation, but trust me, it will change. I don't know if it'll become more beautiful, but it will change. So there's hope for the future. You'll also see a few other things. So the first example of virtualization of the sky comes from my profession, as Alberto said earlier on. I'm very lucky because I work uh, with something that I really like very much. And I will talk about one of my passions, that is to say astronomy, physics, uh, which is the science uh, which, that we have to try and understand the universe that we live in. And I do it with the museum. We have a beautiful interactive museum. There are experiments. But above all, I do it through the planetarium. Tools or instruments or venues like the planetariums have evolved. They remained uh, the same for several decades with the what we call the optomechanical. Have you ever been to a planetarium which is an optomechanical one? Have you? Yes, someone has. And have you visited the Milan one? Yes, very beautiful. That is a elegant one, a good example of an orthomechanical one. The idea is quite simple. There is a light within a sphere which has been pierced and through those holes a light can exit to the point that it hits a sphere that is there. Each one of these luminous points represent a star. If uh, you make the holes appropriately and add le lenses uh, above uh, your head, you can see the sky, but that is clearly virtual sky. Uh, but uh, th we, you can do certain things. For example, you can progress in time, simulate uh, the sky at various latitudes. Uh, but then there was a change. Uh, that is to say, digital planetaria. And um, they're basically a system of projection, uh, like the one you're using here, maybe slightly more luminous, and a series of uh, computers Uh, one or more computers uh, that uh, pr project an image, and this uh, give us, gives us a lot of freedom because, as you know, uh, for considering all the things that we have um, from science, we have a lot of data. And in fact, sometimes we have too much information, too much data of what we had. There is so much data that to be able to understand in these enormous archives becomes very difficult. So a digital planetarium enables us uh, to take all these data, for example, imagine a mission which starts and left not so long ago, Gaia, and they have to map the stars of our galaxy. They're not all of them. They're about 200 billion, but they will do it with a certain number of them. Imagine that in your mind of how all these stars are positioned. We're talking about tens of thousands of thousands of stars. It's virtually impossible. But if this information is then put into a, fed into a computer and then ask the computer to project it in a 3D space, then you can be sitting underneath the planetarian dome uh, looking around you and see the data uh, which uh, are represented in the 3D space. Uh, certainly, these are tools uh, that are developing. They make it possible for us uh, uh, to do imp things imp that are very difficult uh, to see our galaxy from the outside. What's the, the uh, space? Is, uh, it's a, a spiral. Yes, uh, if you wonder how to use a gong again, you can. Our galaxy is very big. In fact, there are 100,000 
light years in diameter, but we will never be able to take a camera, go out and see how it's made from the outside because it's too long a trip. But in a planetarium, you can do it because if you know what the distribution of the stars is, and if we have all of this data to live in a virtual area, we can then use a camera that will see the Milky Way from the outside and will allow us to travel along the spirals and the arms of this galaxy. So the virtualization of the sky works very well in the planetarium, but certainly these are very bulky uh, tools because you need big domes uh, to give you the idea that you're under the sky and still quite expensive. So what I thought I would do this evening is to bring a few examples of the virtualization of the sky, uh, which can happen and be used on your desks. I'll be getting up, yes. And here you see the part uh, which involves uh, Well, soon uh, they should be a black, uh, please, can you please, yes, a black image. Um, I would like to talk about augmented reality. Have any, has anybody ever heard of it here? It could have been worse. Uh, I'm very pleased. At least some of you have an idea. Augmented reality enshrines uh, in its name an, an idea. You start from reality, and we have reality. Those are you. This is the opportunity uh, to say hello to all the, your relatives and friends. Uh, so let us start from the reality. This is the table that we have. This is the computer, so on and so forth. In this reality, we're now going to immerse a number of objects uh, that technically are called markers. Can you? see little piece of paper square that doesn't represent anything. But uh, with the software, you can tell the computer when you see one of these markers, uh, put uh, a 3D model on it. You can see it. You see? Here, there's a euro to give you an order of magnitude. But in this case, I have associated the model of the Earth around it. I would like to remind you that one of the great disappointments that I had as a student was the representation of the solar system. You remember where the sun is on the other and all the planets one after the other. Some are bigger, some are small. But when I started looking at the figures and I discovered how the what the size is, because my book uh, represented J Jupiter that was too b was undersized and Mercury that was oversized. If we want to compare two planets uh, that we know very well, such as ours and the red planet, uh, here you can do it. Let me see if I can do it. I did it before. Yes. That's the Earth and uh, Mars. You see? There they are. These are the two planets on the right uh, uh, scale. Excuse, excuse me if I don't look at you, but I have to maintain this. So these are the two planets I was talking about, two planets uh, of the solar system on the right scale. And uh, they can be on your desk. Uh, but I could add other things. So for example, I could add uh, the largest planet, uh, that is to say, Jupiter. Here it is on the same scale, you see. So this is what I would like to have seen in my book uh, on the right scale in terms of size. Uh, but uh, we can, augmented reality can do this. And to give you an idea of how integrated it can be with reality, I've brought another model, which is not really scientific, but which I hope will help us understand how strong the integration. Can you see these two yellow ones, a part of the model? Uh, and uh, you see it looks as if uh, the um, spacecraft uh, is uh, taking off. Uh, here you can see, this is a program that will involve us next year. What is it? It's the LEM. We're very closer to the anniversary of uh, human beings uh, landing on the moon. So augmented reality, this is, is available. This is something that we produce in the museum, and you can get it to work on your smartphone. They do all sorts of things. For example, you can see on the Colosseum, the part of the Colosseum that is missing. So in ter educational terms, it's very interesting. But I also thought that it was very uh, interesting to have the opposite model. That is to say, when we have a virtual model that goes back into reality. For example, you remember computer graphics. That is to say, the art. Uh, 
where you create 3D models of objects. So, well, these models live in computers. Uh, you can then render it and make it uh, a movie. Pixel, uh, Pixar is very good, uh, but you can also do vice versa. That is to say, you have a model in a virtual world uh, living in your computer, and you can take that model and ask a 3D printer to transform that virtual object into a real object. Uh, what is it? This is Curiosity. This is one of the robots uh, that is exploring Mars. So I think uh, that the mixture between virtual and real is becoming increasingly interesting and increasingly available. Because while it was a technology uh, that only very few could access, it didn't have a real impact. This is not the future. I'm showing you the present. These are things uh, that can operate or work on desks. The last uh, thing I would like to mention is uh, the because so far I've been able to show you what I was talking about, why you will have to trust me for this last thing, because I won't be able to show you. These are objects uh, that make it possible for us uh, to immerse ourselves in the virtual world. We have to understand why um, we didn't. Why, when you look at a movie, you immerse yourself in the story, but you still know that there's the world around you, because you're looking at it on a screen, and if you turn your head around, there are other people, there's the real world, and also So while the, you're looking at the screen, it's flat. While we're used to perceiving the world with a stereoscopic vision, that is to say we have two hours, and until the objects are quite close, they make it possible for us to tell the distance. While now we have a technology which makes it possible for you to immerse yourself in a virtual world, that is to say with a stereoscopic vision, with all the visual world around you, the virtual world, tracing your movement. That is to say, if you move your heads, there are sensors that perceive this uh, and show you what you would see if you moved uh, in the same way in a real world. Uh, so all this is integrated in uh, headpieces like this. Uh, maybe some of you will have already seen it or used it. You see what you do, you put it on, and in the front you can see these two lens. Uh, right, can you see them? Right. These are two lenses that you will see through, and the images are generated by a screen that is here in front, but they are two images, one for each eye, so that you can have the stereoscopic perception that normally you would have in everyday life. I'm really sorry that you can't try it, because I believe that there are no words to describe what you feel when you use this. I was lucky enough uh, to try it, uh, to try it on in the museum uh, for our environment. We would like to have a simulator of the space station. We have some of these products, uh, but for example, you can move within the space station. There's still something, because normally we have hands or feet and so on, but they thought about it. Uh, there are these objects, so you hold one in each hand, and uh, when you extend, when you move your hand, it realizes it and reacts to it. So when you have this object on your head and you look around, not only are you immersed in a virtual world with a perception of uh, uh, depth, but your hands are projected in the virtual world. So when you tried this, I saw that there was an object holder, that, like the one that you have, a sort of little cube, a rubber cube, and I was able to hold it. I do something like this with my real hand, and the virtual hand does exactly what mine does uh, and uh, catches it. Moving oneself uh, in uh, the space station, you can't walk because it, there's no gravity and you're free falling, so it means that you have to hold a handle and pull, but you can do it with these objects. Uh, You hold on to it and you move. In my first move, I wandered around, wrapped up the dome. You know what the dome is? It's that beautiful window built into your in here, so we should know it because it's part of our city's heritage. And, this, and you look on the earth. Most of the images that you see from the air, um, from the from sorry, from the atmosphere of the earth, are uh, taken from then. And so I was not really in the space station. I was uh, space station. I was in my office, uh, but uh, uh, the feeling was so uh, so 
emotional, and I think this is the key. If technology, the technology that we use, can generate those emotions, uh, then it's useful, and we can exploit it uh, for a message. In this case, uh, uh, the marvels of the universe, but these are instruments, they're tools. You can use them as you wish. So I would say that today we have reached a very important uh, moment in the development of these objects because you all can access them and the technology is mature. Since they're tools, uh, we have to understand what the best way is to use them because I, for example, with a, if I have a knife, I can peel an apple, but I can kill someone. All these instruments have this double nature. It depends on the user, the message that they convey. So what I would like to do, and this evening, I'm, I'm speaking this evening, and you're silent. I usually like to chat with people, but if you like to, since I am the one that is going to conclude before the... I would like uh, to talk to you about how we should use these means, uh, to what extent we have to push it, because you have very different scenarios. Uh, for example, the first one, which is extremely beautiful, that is to say everybody can experience uh, things uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, uh, for a few people, like being a space person or an astronaut, uh, while well, you could try something which is very close to it. But at the same time, the worst scenario is, do we really want to imagine a world while instead of being here this evening, everybody you were was at home with one of these at home, wearing one of these, convinced of being in a world which is becoming more and more real, because real is what we perceive with our senses. And if one day we were able to uh, trick five senses uh, with uh, the sight and hearing, we're already doing that, and smell, and our brain, if we want it, uh, uh, we will we can trick our brain, and the, the brain accepts a lots of compromise. So what are we going to do with these gadgets, with these devices? What's the best way to use it? What's the scenario for our future, both in terms of the visualization of scientific data that was mentioned earlier on, but also in a more general idea in terms of culture and using tools such as this? Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you Marco Brusa for this Thank you very much, Marco Bruza, for this passionate speech. We have time for a few questions, so please ask any questions. I would like to take the opportunity to ask you to clarify a point. That is to say, a few days ago, we had the news or the confirmation that we had from the Hubble telescope that the universe is expanding. And this uh, is something we knew. But it's not only expanding, we were also told that it's accelerating. So if this is so, it means that the various uh, bodies, the galaxies, uh, are moving further apart. The distance is increasing. All this is not, does it not contradict with the news that astronomers and astrophysics experts say that, that say that the Andromeda galaxy is probably on its way to collide with the with the, the our galaxy that is to say the Milky Way they seem to be contradictory because if distances are increasing why should they clash no 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 There's not a real contradiction because galaxies are not fixed points in the space. In space, they move and they're grouped in groups of galaxies like stars are in the galaxy. There are also some super concentrations of galaxies within this galaxy move. They don't stop. So the fact that galaxies, and in particular, the groups expand following the expansion and faster and do so faster and faster, but within themselves, 
You can also have uh, galaxies that come and crash. We are within the local group of galaxies, and in this group, the speed varies. Since uh, uh, the speed with which they expand, of the expansion differs according to the distance, uh, ours uh, is, uh, for example, comparable to the random movement. So Andromeda is falling towards us, uh, but all in all, we see, we see that movement. But all in all, uh, the local group uh, and the others are distancing themselves. Uh, there's no contradiction, but initially we had that problem. When Hubble saw the first shift so towards the red, uh, that is to say, uh, the speed, he went to look at uh, the blue ones because he said, statistically, I should see as blues and, uh, and uh, reds. So that is, uh, but then he saw that they were all red, uh, that is to say, becoming more and more distant, except the, some of the blue ones, because in some closer by, there are the movements so that can disturb or cover the expansion. Right, any other questions? A voice at the back? Yes. Buonasera a tutti. People have been talking about the Big Bang. The Big Bang comes from I started with a very small atom-sized object that had a virtually or quasi-infinite heat and density, I have not been able to find anything on the origin of this I call the little ball, because clearly the Big Bang had an origin, well, originated from something. What is this? I call it a ball, but it's not really a ball, is it? But w does anybody made any hypothesis on what its origin is? Rovelli says uh, that it started from a fluctuation, a quantum fluctuation of uh, the void. I don't understand what it means, but I can say two things. One is uh, that maybe it's uh, not a ball in the strict sense. It's much smaller than an atom, the concentration of energy. I would call it a concentration of energy which is subsequently expanding with this Big Bang, it translated into matter through mechanisms we're trying to understand where this ball comes from, or I don't know. Who knows? Well, there are num vague ideas. There's the theory of the so-called uh, parallel universes, the multiverse, that is to say that beyond our space, above it, uh, space, uh, there is a space uh, within which, uh, as if it were a sea, and every now and again there are waves uh, which are quantum fluctuations. Some of these quantum fluctuations, when they become very strong, very big, very big waves, uh, inter like the waves of the sea, turn into a universe. So the universe, but, you know, these are ideas that are good ideas, but I'm not, I don't wish to belittle them, but um, they're based, uh, in this case, uh, on the extrapolation of equations. More information is possible if we were to, probably will be obtained when we reach the, closer to the Big Bang when we have quantum gravitational, where the gravitational force and the other forces roughly have the same intensity, and that's in that what you were terming the little ball. Maybe if we manage to go there, maybe with gravitational waves and see a bit more, maybe we could understand a bit more. The current theory tells us that uh, we have, can't get to the other side, so. 
Another question, please. Good evening. I would like to know at what point now where we stand with the nuclear fusion. Yes, for the past 20 years, people have been saying in 20 years. That's all I know. I'm always asking Attilio Ferrari, but since 1950, they're saying that in 50 years we will have it. Now they say 20, with, with the, the last uh, mission, or the latest mission. They say maybe in 20 years. It's a difficult problem. Plasma physics is very complicated. They study them in this polytechnic. There are groups that study nuclear fusion here. And it's complicated. You have to put together the various equations of a movement uh, of uh, the electromagnetic field uh, in under extreme conditions. And in fact, the reason why and it's a very complex system. Even numerical simulations, which I was talking about before, are very difficult in those conditions. They're very complex, difficult, complex. We don't still have the ability, we lack the ability to have, we haven't got strong enough computers, powerful enough computers. The history of uh, atom of fusion is also made more complicated by the fact that we have discovered more and more effects that make the system more unstable. To keep together an object at that temperature, 10 million degrees, you have to use magnetic fields and not just walls. Well, put the magnetic fields. And then at that point, you realize uh, that initially was not expected, even by the plasma specialists, that the system becomes unstable. We have never managed in a lab uh, to reach temperatures were sufficiently high for enough time to experiment physics under those conditions. So that will be the goal of the future, experimentally at least, because then maybe we have another form of instability. And if you're pessimistic, that's what you'll say. But if you're optimistic, you think that if that problem has been solved, it'll be OK. There's time for one more question. I'll ask a question. How important is it in astronomy and astrophysics to have direct observation? And if you'll allow me, do you still have uh, the fascination of uh, having, as you were saying, have, uh, or Bianucci was saying, of having the photons uh, tickling your retina? Uh, it's fascinating, but uh, some of the instruments are more effective than our eye. Our eye can only see one photon out of 100 when we're lucky. Um, the CCD can see one out of two, so there's no competition there. That notwithstanding, the eye, is, the eye sees through the telescope, um, and that is really something, because uh, you then are tickled by the universe. Your eyes are tickled by the universe. This is something very important. Please. Not so long ago, for various reasons, you mentioned uh, to quantum gravity. I would like to ask you a question on this. In that, what was fascinating, which you discussed and illustrated, I've, I really love this. I'm a physicist. Uh, I, I graduated many years uh, ago on the particle clashes. But going back to quantum gravity, in fact, there are people who uh, envisage models, granular models uh, of uh, quantum gravity, but not only, but they say also that time is also granular. Uh, by, if I listen to what has been said this evening, can we envisage uh, the fact that it is uh, something like that uh, will be held by the future? Yes, we need it, Rovelli. I am not an expert, uh, really. In fact, I'm not at all expert uh, uh, in uh, gravitational 
the quantum gravitation. There are some groups uh, here in Turin and in the world who are trying to see the major unification, all the forces put together. Clearly, the res well, results at the present stage changing the outlook uh, not yet available. But unquestionably, it's one of the routes that we have to try and understand the, the essence of the universe, the origin of the Big Bang, and all the rest of it. In any case, in that case, we're really moving towards close to the esoteric sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and see you next week. Thank you, Gertilio Ferrari, Piero Bianucci, and Marco Brusa. See you. Arrivederci a tutti.